Hey, Patrick Sullivan here. Welcome to my shop. Miters are the beautiful, elegant way to handle corners. Done right, they result in a professional and very finished look. But everyone knows that miter joints are dangerously weak joints. If you use them, you really need to reinforce the joints with splines of some type. The concept that miter joints are inherently unreliable is repeated over and over again by experienced woodworkers. Why? Why do these joints sometimes fail? The reason most often given is that miters are essentially ingrain joints, and everybody knows that ingrain glue-ups are extremely weak. However, if you watch the first video in this series, you know that the weakness of ingrain glue is a shop myth. Shockingly, ingrain joints are the strongest simple glue joint by a factor of two. If you've not seen this video, I strongly encourage you to view it to get a good grasp on my experimental setup. The link is in the description below. I'm trying to understand the interaction between wood grain and glue strength. So my first question is, how strong are joints cut at 45 degrees to the grain direction? This is halfway between end grain and side grain. Does that grain orientation weaken it or strengthen it? Oh, and I don't care how many pounds or kilograms of force the joint can take. That absolute number is useless to me. You can't take the forces from these tests and stick them into your project. Unfortunately, structural engineering is far more complicated than that. Instead, I'm looking for relative strength. How strong is this configuration compared to other simple joints? So, I want to test miter-type joints, but in a way that will let me compare them directly with the other simple joints that I tested in the first video. So here's the trick I'm using. Imagine making a large, oversized miter joint. Then turn it 45 degrees like this. Then I cut out a rectangle that's the same shape as the test samples in my earlier studies. Now I have a sample with the same grain direction as in a miter joint, but I can compare the breaking strength directly with end-to-end -end and end-to-side joints. When I cut the samples for my tests, I normally align the pattern with the wood grain. But this time, I'll turn the pattern 45 degrees. I cut diagonally across the board to create 3 inch or 76 millimeter strips. And then trim those with a jig that produces identical squares with the grain running from one corner to the other. When I glue two such blocks together, I get a joint that's exactly the same length, thickness, and orientation as my earlier samples but with the grain running at 45 degrees to the joint. I will call these samples miter cut. Notice that all four sides show identical grain. This is a slippery concept. Side grain disappears, and all the cut edges look similar to end grain. Under my microscope, this oak square cut at 45 degrees looks indistinguishable from end grain, and all four sides look the same. I glued up pairs of blocks from five different species of wood. Once the glue had cured for a minimum of two days, I put them in my press and measured the total amount of force required to break the sample. The results will surprise some of us, including me, who were pretty sure that miters were effectively end grain. It turns out miter cut samples do not behave in the same way as end grain samples. They fail in a fashion that's roughly halfway between end grain and side grain glue joints. This cherry sample is fairly typical. The break starts in the glue line, but quickly splits the lignin bonds as well. In the pine samples, the lignin bonds gave up first. Why did they break this way? I developed an animation showing force vectors that tried to explain this in a quasi-engineering fashion. However, it, it feels like overkill. Most of my viewers probably already know all this. For those few who don't love vector calculus, I think it's sufficient to point out that in the miter cut samples, the cellulose fibers are not aligned to take full advantage of their great strength. And the lignin, which is sharing part of the load, 
will easily split between the fibers. Just like it did in this poplar sample. The lignin split in 80% of my test pieces, often splitting in two to three different places. Watch the glue line open. Okay, let's see it again, up close. Let me show you a summary of the results of testing in a picture. If you saw my earlier video, you'll recognize the diagram. For each species of wood, the green box represents a range of values at which the lignin bonds split open on side-to-side -side and end-to-side -side joints. The gold box shows the range of values for the force required to fracture the glue on end-to-end -end joints. The blue boxes show the forces required to break miter cut samples. In general, they're a little stronger than side-to-side -side and end-to-side -side joints, but weaker than end-to-end -end joints. Am I saying that miters are weak? No. Miters are not inherently weak. They are inherently strong. Keep in mind that, in practice, the difference between strong and weak is often a function of geometry. If you're making a huge picture frame out of relatively thin stock, then those long frame sides will exert enormous stress on the tiny miter joint. In my samples, which are all the same size, the relative strength of miters was as strong or stronger than simple side-to-side -side or end-to-side -side joints. We depend on side grain joints every day. Nobody's warning you about the fragile nature of panels and tabletops glued up side by side. Why then are so many voices from experienced woodworkers warning about miters? Well, I suspect that many experienced woodworkers have had a surprise failure of a miter joint at one time or another. Why? Judging from comments on my earlier video, the most popular theory is that seasonal wood movement destroys the glue joint over time. Now it's indisputable that wood expands and contracts with changes in humidity, so the argument is plausible. I'm not enchanted by this theory, in large part because I have seen so many miters that have survived for 30 years or more with no sign of failure. However, this theory is difficult to actually disprove. I could glue up 100 joints, let them sit quietly for 40 or 50 years, and then measure their breaking strength. Unfortunately, I don't think I'll be around to finish this experiment. Let me propose one alternate explanation for why miter joints might fail. Making one miter joint is easy. Making four miter joints that come together to form a frame or a box is a lot harder. To make perfect mitered frames, the craftsman has to religiously adhere to two rules. First, each corner has to be exactly 90 degrees. Any combination of cuts that add up to 90 degrees will work. Second, the length of opposite sides must be identical. Not pretty close, identical. If you violate either of these rules, you end up with open miters. Clearly, if the miters are wide open, they'll lose almost all of their strength. But what happens if the gap at the open end of the miter is small enough that it might be cosmetically acceptable? You know, a little wood filler and nobody will notice. I thought I could actually test this by gluing up miter cut blocks with a little sliver of plastic cut from a milk bottle which keeps one end from completely closing. This test sounded good in theory, but in practice it's been difficult to get clean, decisive results. I've done this experiment three times and I'm still not satisfied. I can report this much. For glue lines that are about 3 inches or 75 millimeters long, a gap at one end of a miter that measures one-tenth to four-tenths of a millimeter does not seem to weaken the joint appreciably. Those joints snap open at forces similar to joints with no spacer that were closed completely. You could ignore errors of this size. Gaps of 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters make the joint behave differently, but still preserves quite a bit of the joint strength. If peak strength is not an issue, then you can probably ignore errors of this size. Gaps of one millimeter, that's four hundredths of an inch or more, result in joints that fail progressively. When stressed, the joint opens imperceptibly, starting at the open end, and very slowly opens until the force on the joint has been reduced. At first, I believe this was because the thicker glue line was not completely curing in two days. 
However, I got exactly the same results when I let the glue cure for 10 days. I don't know if waiting two to three months would change the outcome or not. Gaps of two millimeters cause the joint to lose more than 50% of its rigidity, and the joint will eventually fail at low forces, but it may tolerate surprisingly higher loads for a few seconds. Despite this ability to fail slowly and progressively, these joints will clearly ultimately fail if subjected to long-term loads. The higher the load, the faster it will fail. Will very low forces cause the joint to fail over a period of days or weeks or months? I don't think I have enough patience to find out. Is that the end of the story? I don't think so. Open miters are not the only cause of glue failure. Everybody has their own pet theory on why you sometimes see a glue surprise. I will try to investigate some of those potential causes in a future video. So, in conclusion, budded miter joints that are perfectly cut should be as strong or stronger than most of the other simple joints that you regularly use. If you fail to achieve flawless cuts, then maybe you should consider adding splines. If your accuracy was terrible, then the spline may be the only thing holding the joint together. How much strength do splines add? Well, that can be a subject for future research. My preliminary tests suggest we could be in for some surprises. I hope this was helpful. The myth that miters are inherently weak because they are end grain joints is clearly wrong. But hiding behind that myth is the truth that inaccurately cut miters are inherently weak. I want to personally thank you all for the intelligent and courteous commentary that you've been providing. It's a genuine pleasure to be part of a YouTube community that can discuss differences of opinion without resorting to profanity, insults, and personal attacks. Woodworkers are clearly a much higher class of people. As always, thanks for watching.